I'm going to talk with you about the role of schools in democratic societies. And I want to start with a thought experiment. If you can imagine yourself sitting in your chair, but suddenly you feel the chair shaking, and you start rising up into the air, and you're going in the air, and you go through the ceiling, and through the next floor, and through the roof of the building, and you go through the air, you're looking down on Puerto Alegre, you go up, 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 through the atmosphere, through the stratosphere, and into space. And now you're sitting in space, and you're looking down, and that earth is turning below you, and it's quiet up there, and you can breathe because this is a thought experiment, and you're there for a few minutes, and then suddenly you start to feel your chair shake again, and you start to go down, and you go down through space, down through the stratosphere, down through the atmosphere, down through the air, through the, the ceiling of a building, down through a few floors, and boom, you land in a classroom somewhere on planet Earth. Now, it's a thought experiment, so you can't tell where you are based on the clothes people are wearing or the language they're talking. And here's my question. Would you be able to tell whether you had landed in a democratic country or in, say, a totalitarian dictatorship? Would you be able to tell? It sounds like a bit of a facetious question, but I don't mean it that way. Because many of us would like to think, of course, of course you can tell. Our schools in democratic countries would have nothing to do. They're not at all the same as schools in a totalitarian dictatorship or a religious theocracy or a country run by a military junta. They would be completely different. But when you think about it, a lesson in math, in fractions, teaching a foreign language, balancing an equation in chemistry, the composition of soil in science, many of these lessons would be, could be the same in many countries around the world. This question interests me so much because it raises the next question. What, if anything, should be different in schools, in democratic societies, than in schools in a totalitarian dictatorship? To answer that question, we have to think what should be different about citizens in, in a democratic society and in a totalitarian dictatorship. Citizens in a totalitarian dictatorship have a pretty easy job. They have to do what the leader says. There's one story, there's one version of truth, it's handed down on high, maybe it's written on two tablets carried down from a mountain, maybe it's in policies, maybe it's in edicts and laws, but citizens are to obey the law, to do what they're told, and to be nice to each other, to be kind, to help other people, but they're not to question things. They're not to participate in making decisions because that's done by the leader or maybe a group of leaders. Citizens in a democratic society have different requirements. In a democratic society, we need citizens who are engaged in knowing the problems that are faced by the society and, and thinking about ways to solve those problems. We need citizens who are coming together to figure out how to make decisions about how we all should live. All of us in democratic societies have something to say about how we all should live. So again, let's go back to my question. What should schools in a democratic society teach students so that they have the skills and the knowledge and the attitudes to be able to participate in making decisions about how we all should live? But before we go there, let me say what schools shouldn't do. Because unfortunately, for the last 25 years of school reform, around the world, we've been moving in the opposite direction. We've been obsessed with standardized testing in only two subject areas, math and literacy. We've been obsessed with standards 
and accountability that put teachers in straitjackets and limit what they can do in the classroom, that narrow the curriculum. Now, I have nothing wrong with standards, and I have nothing wrong with accountability. Um, I've never met a teacher who didn't have standards. Teachers, and all teachers feel accountable. They're accountable to their students, to the parents, to the principal, to the community. The problem is not with the word standards. The problem is with the word standardization. Because standardization literally means making everything the same. Now, if I go to a McDonald's and I order a quarter pounder with cheese, I know that that quarter pounder with cheese is going to come out a certain way that I remember, that I'm used to. And if I go to another city all the way around the world and I go to another McDonald's and I order a quarter pounder with cheese, I know that that quarter pounder with cheese is going to be standardized. It works for McDonald's, but schools are not McDonald's. Schools need to brim with the passion and interests of individual teachers and individual students. Schools need to deal with local passions and local interests to be able to engage with what's important to those teachers and those students at a particular time. Nobody knows those students better than the teacher working with them. Nobody knows what's going on with those students at home, whose parent has been sick, Who's been out on the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic? Who's had a problem with the local community council? Who's involved in this community action group or that community action group? But when we standardize the curriculum, we make it all the same. We take away from teachers the professional autonomy they need to make the curriculum interesting, to engage students with the real problems and the real issues that engage them in democratic thinking. If we want students to engage democratically, and we want them to be able to think democratically, we need to give them the local and the regional and the national and the global issues to think about. We need to do a few things for those students. First, we need to teach them to ask difficult questions. Remember, in a totalitarian dictatorship, you're not supposed to ask questions. But in a democracy, it's a responsibility to ask questions. And to ask questions, you need to know that there are problems in the world and that it's up to students, up to you, up to all of us, to help solve those problems. So we need to ask essential questions. And schools need to teach students that they have to ask questions, that they have to question the world around them, question the wisdom that they see, question even the textbooks, even the curriculum, to think about it. Secondly, students need to deal with multiple perspectives. Because in a dictatorship or a religious theocracy, you have only one perspective. But a democracy requires that we are able to traffic in many different opinions, many different values, many different backgrounds. Just as Darwin's theory of evolution relies on a theory of genetic variation, democracy requires on a theory of a multiplicity of ideas, the idea that there are many ways of looking at the world out there and that we have to do what we can to understand those different perspectives and make decisions for ourselves to move forward. Finally, we have to recapture a better sense of politics that we have in the world right now. I say politics and I already see many of you smile because politics has become a dirty word in our culture, in many cultures. If I say, oh, you're just being political, it's like I've hurled an insult at you, like you're a mudslinging candidate running for office and all you care about is your own advancement and power. But politics has a much more noble history Bernard Crick has his famous book, In Defense of Politics. And in it, he says that politics is the way that people in a democratic society come together and work out their differences to move forward towards social policy. Students need to be taught that definition of politics. They need to ask essential questions, 
understand that there are problems in the world. They need to be able to deal with multiple perspectives and they need to recapture a sense of the noble definition of politics. Let me close with a quote from the wonderful philosopher Maxine Green, who said that the purpose of education is to comfort the troubled and trouble the comfortable. I love that quote because what she means is, of course schools need to provide comfort for students. Students need to be free of bullying. They need to have safe spaces where they can try out new ideas, where they can fail, where they can feel free to be themselves and to work with others. But if we stop there, that's not enough for a democratic society because students also need to be able to made, be made to feel a little bit uncomfortable about the world around them. They need to know that there are things out there that need changing, that there are problems that we all have to come together with to solve and that they are part of the solution. That's what schools in democratic societies require. Thank you. <laughs>